Welcome to our Google Plus Hangout. Hello, and welcome to the 2014 Traveler Photo Contest Google Hangout. I'm Sarah Pulger, a senior photo producer with National Geographic Travel. And joining me today are two contest judges, including the director of photography for Traveler Magazine, Dan Westergren. Hello, Dan. Nice to see you. Hey, great to see you. Thanks for joining our hangout, everybody. I'm here in Washington, D.C., talking to people from all around the world. And our 2014 guest judge, David Hobby. David, so nice to have you here. Hey, Sarah. Hey, everybody. Uh, I'm joining from my home uh, near Baltimore, Maryland, in the United States. And we are also very excited and pleased today to have the top three finalists from the photo contest, including Mark Korosek, Mark Hanauer, and Agniska uh, Traksiska. Uh, welcome all. Thank you for joining us. And congratulations on your win. Um, we're excited to have everyone from around the world participating on the Google Hangout today. So please be sure to share your questions with us on Facebook, on Twitter, and Google+. Remember to use the hashtag, Let's Explore, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can. Before we dig into some of the questions we have already received, let's talk a little bit about the contest and travel photography. As a reminder to everyone, this was the 26th annual Traveler Photo Contest, and we were thrilled to receive incredible images from around the globe, including over 18,000 entries from over 90 countries. And we sat down and, and finally came to the finalists that we're able to speak with today. David, do you want to speak a little bit about your experience as a guest judge at the contest? Uh, sure, sure. I'd be happy to. It was a really eye-opening experience. Um, on the one hand, it was really in inspiring, and on the other hand, it was really depressing to realize how much just amazing work 18,000 people with cameras are producing around the world right now. Um, so you guys sent me 500 pictures, and it was my job to take it down to 125 in sort of a pre-edit before I came in. And the first few maybe went kind of easily, but very quickly, it started feeling like you were pushing your loved ones off of a cliff. It, it, it was very, very, very difficult to, to even begin to winnow that list down because they were fantastic. Absolutely, absolutely. It is. It's, it's always very difficult in the end, and that's, that's both the pleasure and, and the challenge for us in the office as editors. And, and Dan, actually, you're an editor throughout the year, but you're also in the field shooting as a photographer. How do any of those skills translate when you're judging these contest submissions? Well, like David said, it was like pushing your loved ones off the cliff to choose the photo. And so for me, the, the most important lesson, luckily, I think I learned early on, was that when you get back and you look at the photos, you really have to separate how you took those pictures from whether the pictures are any good. It's really easy as a photographer to get attached to a picture because you think about all the hours you spent to get that image. Mm -hmm. But luckily, I've spent a lot of time looking through a lot of great photographers' work, and so the bar is so high, I just have to really release myself and say, don't, you know, is it a good picture or not? Don't think about, you know, how cold you were or how close you came to death or how much you like the subject in the picture. You really just need to judge the picture on its merits, and so that's, you know, what we tried to do. Now, with that said, I'm really happy to say that the three photos that we chose for the top three places, there was a great deal of background work that went into each of those photos, and we'll be talking about that, but it's, it's, these are not just photographs that somebody happened to be walking down the street and snapped a picture. So, the other thing is that we, we also tried to think hard about, is it a travel photo? That A travel photo is a very difficult category to define, and I think sometimes, especially in the photo contest, we want to stretch that category and just say, you know, there's two measuring sticks that we use all the time, and one is, does it show you what the place looked like? But the most successful picture for travel photography will maybe show the viewer what it felt like to be there. And I think that in each case of these photographs, we got a little bit of that feeling. And that's what really pushed them to the top of the pile. Absolutely, absolutely. No, and I think that is kind of the step away that editors do have from the photographer in there in the field. We're able to, we don't always have the background on how many hours it took to make that photograph, and we're really looking for a storytelling image that transports us somewhere and teaches us about a land or a culture. And a, 
these three top finalists certainly did that this year, and, and I can't wait uh, to speak to the winners a little bit further about that. David, I mean, how do you feel about that? We had a question from Anita Ravji that was posted on Google+, and she says, what features does a travel photo need to be successful? And from your perspective as a judge, you know, what were you looking at in that realm? Uh, it, for me, it was pretty simple. Uh, I try to distill it down to, to gut reactions and down to two gut reactions, um, one of them being, um, does that picture make me want to go to that place? Do I want to go explore that place more? And, and two, um, is w would I have loved to have taken that picture myself? So as a photographer and a traveler, I think that, that merging those two compass points can really help you zero in on a picture pretty quickly. Absolutely. Well, kind of in that vein, let's let's hop into it and take a look at our second place winner. It's a picture of a very newlywed couple, um, and let's have our photographer speak a little bit to that scene and tell us a little bit more how this picture was made and, and came to be. Agnieszka? Yes. Uh, so um, I made this picture in Masharim. This is an ultra-Orthodox district of uh, Jerusalem, uh, Israel. So in short, uh, that was a picture it may not at my ter territory. Uh, I am, as you can see, a modern girl from Europe, and all of the sudden, uh, a few years ago, I um, I started um, to to shoot to uh, to make pictures of uh, uh, ultra orthodox communities, uh, which is uh, frankly very difficult. Why? Because um, you know, first of all, sex uh, segregation is very very strict within those communities. If I am a woman, this is, uh, this is the first reason uh, to understand that this is a mission impossible, uh, to have a big camera and uh, to enter the places uh, where, uh, in fact, a um, uh, woman has uh, no chance to enter the place where, uh, where uh, men are praying or dancing or uh, studying the Torah. And those subjects, those issues are the most interesting for photographers who deal with uh, ultra-dox uh, community. So uh, I had to be patient, I had to learn rules, I, I did my homework and uh, I was keeping coming back, uh, making step by step, uh, I gained trust. Uh, uh, this, this family uh, in, uh, you can witness is the family of 15 which uh, for the last four years I visited a couple of times, especially during the Jewish feast, where the, uh, the families are a little bit more open as the matter of uh, uh, interaction with outsiders. And uh, last year they told me that the oldest son is to uh, get married. They invited me uh, for, this, um, uh, for this wedding. And uh, this is, that, that was the opportunity I just couldn't miss. So uh, on February I, um, I went to Israel, especially for this occasion. Uh, I didn't expect that I will be privileged uh, to witness probably the most intimate moment when the young couple, after uh, after the uh, the chupa, so the moment that uh, they are announced, um, uh, wife and um, and husband, uh, they are to stay alone. Uh, this is very special, uh, special, uh, special. Why? Why? Because this marriage was arranged, arranged. Um, by families, uh, those youngsters uh, saw each other only once uh, before uh, before the wedding. Wow. So this is exactly the first moment that they, first of all, will talk to each other without anybody witnessing the the, 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 the fact. Probably they will, I don't know, they will touch their hands or they will kiss. I have no idea. I uh, I knew um, the reaction. They were so excited. There was shyness, there was fondness, there was maybe some kind of a fear. Uh, probably it was very stressful, but in the same time very, very happy uh, moment. And um, I was uh, in exclusive group. I would say of two or three people who uh, who um, were standing at the corridor uh, because the, the the room was very very small uh, and uh, I I was happy and uh, I've managed to 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 make this capture. Absolutely, and I think you know even without all that additional information, this emotional moment. It's both subtle and nuanced, and at the same time, it's so strong that it does visually speak and begin to tell 
this story. It really did stand out to us as judges. Dan, do you do you want to talk a little bit further to this photo as well? Well, in my comments that I put online, it was I just when that picture came up, I was just so happy to see it because it it does show a sense of place, and in this picture, the sense of place comes primarily from the dress of the participants in the ceremony. But I also I, I said this in in you know in my comments online, and I really really think this that any picture that makes me think as much as this picture did is just a great picture. When I looked at that couple without knowing the background because we know that those Orthodox communities have arranged marriages you could just guess that I mean this looks like a photograph of a first date mm -hmm. and then to think about the fact that this couple is going to spend the rest of their lives together it just you want to keep looking at the picture because it's you can't believe how different their experience in life is from our my own but also it doesn't it doesn't seem like a sad occasion it's it looks like just a wonderful moment and I think that I had, if I thought about how did the photographer get this picture, I wondered maybe if you were family or something. And, you know, later on we found out that, no, this is just all the hard work that you put in to, to get yourself into this community because you're curious to show this community. So, Agnieszka, this is just a fantastic job of digging into a culture. You know, what, what, what I think and uh, what, what I'm thinking about looking at the feedback of this picture now is that uh, uh, emotions are universal and uh, in the time of wars and all those negative impulses uh, which m media shares with us every day, I think that people are longing to a uh, very simple and very authentic Feelings and uh, this is this is something what uh, what captured my mind and uh, my sensitivity and I'm very happy that uh, uh, looking at uh, people's reaction I, I see the same people are smiling uh, looking at this picture looking at the reaction of of those youngsters that's that that's fantastic yeah absolutely well and actually kind of relevant to this discussion we just have a question in for us from Google Plus and Giovanni asks. Does an everyday picture have more possibilities of winning compared to an exotic mm. picture or a never before seen picture? And I think, you know, I'll speak to this a little bit. We see an answer to this in our three finalists. We see an absolutely incredible storm and weather occurrence. It's, it's very unusual. And we also see a smaller kind of daily life, though at the same time, as we all know, this, this community um, and our second prize winner is very hard to reach and hard to find, but it's, it's a small, it's an intimate moment that leaves the viewer really studying and wanting to know more. So I think the answer we see before us is no, there's not, there's not one way to win a photo contest. In the end, it needs, it needs to be an arresting photo that the viewer stays with, and there's a story being told, and we want to we wanna learn more. How do, how do you feel about it, David? Um, it, it's funny, it, there are two words that, that pop up in my mind when I think of travel, and one is traveler and the other is tourist. Um, and I think a tourist is somebody that kind of goes in on a more superficial level perhaps, um, and, and a traveler is someone who really goes in and explores a place. And this to me really spoke to not just exploring a place, but, but traveling within a different culture. So I, I really felt that this was a picture that wasn't made in 125th of a second, it was made over several years and, and, and that was a it was a very strong connection for me. Absolutely, absolutely. And that and that kind of also um, let's take a look at our third place winner you know, Sarah, now. I want to ask a question about this one. Yeah, sure. This, I, this is a loaded question. So Agnieszka, what kind of camera did you use to take this picture? Uh, I, uh, I'm using uh, Canon um, Mark III, Canon 5D Mark III. Okay, the reason it's a loaded question is because I see a lot of talk about cameras and people thinking that, oh, with my camera was just smaller or maybe I should use a Leica because that's the only way that I can capture true human emotion. The big camera gets in the way. And that's not my experience at all. I think that it's all about the photographer. It's all about the relationship that yeah. you build with the people in the subject. And the Canon 5D Mark III, that's not a tiny camera. It's a relatively large camera. And I don't know about your experience, but I find that if you're serious with the people and they understand why you're there, the size of the camera is just like the last thing that anybody's thinking about. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, I started, uh, uh, when I started to talk about my um, experience with ultra-Orthodox communities, uh, I told that uh, this is some kind of an obstacle to be a photographer, to have a big camera, and in a way this is true. 
it, it, but at the second uh, hand, uh, it gives uh, my characters, people who I want to capture, uh, a very visible signal who I am. That I am not a thief who is sneaking with a small camera, is hiding around the corner, you know. I'm a photographer, I'm making a fair job. I will not use uh, those pictures against my characters. And uh, I do everything, you know, with open face. Um, so, in a way, I think it helps me, and uh, particularly uh, the camera I'm using is, is very helpful because uh, I don't have flash. I, I don't use flash, uh, and uh, the sensitivity of uh, of of, uh, of the lens of, of the camera is really a fantastic tool and extremely helpful uh, thing to, to to make a picture like that. Oh, great! Thanks. Absolutely, no. That that's a great point. And actually, speaking of that, Mark, your uh, your camera was encased in a water casing when you took your winning photograph of a diver underwater. Can you tell us a little bit more about how this photograph came to be? Yes, uh, this photograph is special because uh, the place, the, this lake, it just exists for a few weeks, only uh, eight years. Uh, because um, the, rise, uh, the, the, the water level rises up with the snow melt uh, at each spring. But uh, you can don't know uh, at which moment is the good moment. Where one year it's in May, the next year it's in June. You don't know, and it's a very difficult. You can to be on the on this place at the, in the good time. It's a very difficult, and the difficult is the weather condition. When I come to the lake, uh, the rise level is uh, only six meter, and in six meters, you don't have the grass on the tree uh, underwater. You must to be wait. And I wait, I wait seven days, five days, uh, very bad condition. But uh, we are lucky with this bad condition, uh, with the condition, because the rise, uh, the, the lake level rise up to 10 meters. And the last oh, day, 10 meters. <laughs> yeah, 10, 10 meters. And the last day, we have the, the tree branch under the water, and no, you can see. Oh yes, and you you must to pray to have the sun. <laughs> it is the, <laughs> the, the last the, the last touch, and uh, I pray, I pray, and I have the sun the last day, and uh, and the tree branch with the foliage, with the sun, with the grass, uh, with the way. Uh, I just put the diver to for. Uh, Showing it is underwater uh, landscape <laughs> because uh, it is incredible. Uh, a lot of people say, but it's a fake. It's a Photoshop. Uh, um, well, it's a Photoshop work, but uh, no, it's a real. Uh, it's really but it, it, this this scenery just exists for a few days. Few days later, the rise uh, go down and. Uh, and it's finished. You must wait for the next year. It's absolutely an, an otherworldly scene. And uh, thank you for sharing it with us. I, it's one I had not seen before. And uh, Dan and David, uh, Mark was telling us a little bit about his experience and how he has been developing in the field. We just have a question in from social media with the hashtag Let's Explore. And the question comes to us from Mumbai, and it says, What's the best way to begin developing skills in photography? And we're hearing from our different participants today and, and certainly people we interact with in our daily jobs, but what would you advise for someone that wants to grow their photography? What's the best way to do that? David? Well, that's kind of a loaded question for me. It is. Because it, it, it is, and I'm going completely the other way. I mean, and as someone who literally runs a website that's devoted to teaching skills and teaching lighting in particular, I'm going to say that, yeah, you do need some skills and know your f-stops and shutter speed and, and, and shutter speeds and understand your camera like the back of your hand so you're not spending a lot of your mind share worrying about the camera when you're taking pictures. But the most important thing, I think, is to remember that a camera is a box that captures moments and experiences. So the, the best advice I can give to people is to upgrade the moments and experiences and things that are in front of your camera. And that doesn't mean 
like travel 10,000 miles, but really think about where and when you're going to be and with whom, um, because all the technical prowess in the world is not going to make an amazing picture if there's nothing good in front of your camera. Absolutely, no, and I think, you know, Mark did the planning just as all of our winners did to get there, and people often ask about the fanciest camera, the different ways that I can and go about this with technologically purchasing a skill set, but it's really about patience and spending time where you want to photograph, getting to know your environment, learning your subjects, being comfortable and so that you're, the people that you're photographing are comfortable, uh, and really understanding the place. Uh, Dan, do you want to speak to that a little bit further, too? Well, I would like to know, Mark, how did you know that this even existed? Uh, by chance. Uh, one day I received a mail with a picture of a bench under the water. Hmm. Uh, An ordinary picture, but a bench under the water uh, of my uh, father-in-law. Okay, I look this. What is it? Where is it? And uh, we make search, but we have a, um, um, uh, not a lot of information in French language of, of this place. And uh, after a lot of search on the internet, I find the Green Lake, the, uh, the Grüner See, uh, in Austria, and uh, I I search information about this, and uh, I I I say to me. Uh, uh, I go there and I go to <laughs> maybe it's cool <laughs> and uh, I, I go and by chance I'm I'm in place in the good time but the first time it, it was a chance yeah, yeah. so well, the, the other question was did you go there to have the diving experience or because you knew it would make a good picture or both the diving experience is important uh, for an uh, underwater picture. And the, uh, first, uh, I, I have uh, an experience in photography. And, and after, I have an experience of diver. And the uh, same together, uh, you can make a photography, a good photography underwater. Because you have a lot of problem with the buoyancy, with the regulator, the technology. Uh, of the diving system, and you must control the diving system and the photographic system. It's a it's a difficult. So the, the what I'm trying to think about, I'm I'm getting at a point that I'd like to make that if in in relation to the question that was asked, if you are involved in an activity that not very many other people know things about then and you're active as, as a photographer then it's a really good lesson to take the lesson from Mark to combine your passions together in order to make an image or to make images that other people can't make and that's what he's done here uh, so, sorry uh, Dan, I don't uh, understand it, it, Can you no repeat? it's fine I was just congratulating that you took your two passions diving and photography and you yeah. were able to make the most wonderful picture by researching that location. And that's the kind of thing that we do here all the time is we try to find great places to take pictures and figure out what it takes to get there. So. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it, it was a great job. Great job. Yeah, job. thank you. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> thank you. But, uh, yes, in, in my passion of um, uh, diving, uh, I search in first the first time for me the first interest. It's find um, a special place. Uh, uh, I don't think uh, ah, I want to be to go deep or I want to go uh, in the Maldivian. No, I just search a special thing. I, I like to go in the river. Maybe just only uh, two or three meter uh, water level, but just in the river you have uh, special things. In the, this lake, it's special. You can make a uh, old uh, industrial diver uh, in a two meter water. Uh, it, it's uh, it's a very 
special. Uh, I I I, uh, I dive for the for the photography for special photography, but uh, I don't. Uh, yes, I dive for dive, but uh, I research for, uh, the, the original uh, photographic uh, place. Yeah, that's great. That's a great segue into our winning photo that Marco um, Marco Korosek, who shot this picture of a super sap. And Marco, tell us a little bit about, th mm, this is not wow. just a photograph for you, this is your life, it sounds like. How do you come to, why are you so interested in weather extremes? Yes, uh, exactly. I was... Um I was in uh, primary school, uh, it was secondary school, uh, we had some uh, nature uh, lessons and I became interested in, uh, in weather, uh, just monitoring weather and stuff and then uh, when I saw the development of internet in the, in the years, the following years, I was uh, becoming more interested in, uh, in, in weather, so um, uh, in weather photography, so I just uh, started following stuff, uh, getting uh, more, let's say, impressive, uh, impressive uh, structure from the nature, and uh, that's how I find the uh, super cells and uh, such like, like tornadoes or big hail, and which comes uh, associated with, uh, with the storms, and then I just decided to to move to the next level and get to the United States, to the tornado alley, to the let's say so called the best place uh, for such uh, impressive storms and uh, it's just becoming my passion um, now it, and I'm doing it uh, also over here in my home place in Slovenia and uh, the, the neighbor countries I'm just uh, doing like storm chasing in this area and then each year I try to go also for one month or several weeks uh, in the tornado alley just to observe this storm because they are so impressive, I cannot, I cannot get used to it. Every, everyone is just simply different, but this one for me was was like from the outer space when I was uh, approaching uh, it from the from this set. Now at home in Slovenia, you work with weather broadcasting, and then now you've told us that you go to Tornado Alley a few times each year if you can. How do you chase storms? Do you have to? sign up with somebody or do you just have weather radio like radios in your car oh sarah's back now we lost her for hello a few. hello there was there was a major storm no no yeah. I, apologize, <laughs> I apologize for that everyone thank you so marco how how do you plan a storm chase trip to go to the you know tornado alley uh, actually, uh, in the first year when I was in 2006, it was my first year in Tornado Alley, I was uh, joining uh, some uh, more experienced veteran uh, chasers, so just to get the uh, first touch of such, uh, such thing uh, in, the, in the open field in the country which I had never been. And then following the, the following years, uh, I went alone with a couple of friends uh, just to, to better um, Let's say to save some money with splitting costs for uh, for motor stuff for uh, for renting a car and equipment. And actually, uh, uh, how the storm chases uh, how the storm chasing working is that uh, we just have a laptop with uh, access to radar data, satellite data, and all the meteorological data which is possible uh, from the from the let's say the chasing area. So if we are chasing in a form or Kansas or something, so we just look all all the data which is available and then. Uh, with my experiences from meteorology, I just uh, try to get uh, to the best spot where, uh, where there is a highest probability from the, from the severe storms to produce. And then uh, when they start, we're just uh, starting following them and uh, adjusting our position uh, just to have uh, the best view on them and just, of course, to avoid uh, the damage which could cause to us. So I'm guessing... I'm oh, guessing go ahead, Dan. don't sign the collision damage waiver on your rental car. But um, this <laughs> photograph, did you take it, you pulled off to the side of the road, or did you feel like, oh my goodness, this is going to be a tornado, or were you hoping there would be a tornado, or was this the type of cloud that would not lead to a tornado? Uh, actually, this uh, when we were approaching from the north, we saw it on the radar that uh, it's developing, uh, it's a very good storm developing, and we just uh, were, were driving towards it. 
And then uh, it was actually the tornado one, so uh, the National Water Service uh, from that area uh, decided to issue the tornado warning, so it, it could produce tornado. It was open field, so there was no, no actual no actual danger for the for the residents. But uh, it didn't produce uh, any any damage except some large hail, maybe some just sporadic uh, isolated large hail and uh, some heavy heavy rain. But when we were approaching to that one uh, to this position, we just pulled over for. Uh, for, let's say one minute, and then I just decided, whoa, this is wow. this is one of one one of the shots you, you don't see every day. So because usually we are we are watching such storms from the eastern side. Uh, if you're looking at the photo, we are we were approaching from the north, and then we would we were expecting to turn to the left. But uh, on this side, I just decided to stop and uh, and see into the structure because we we left uh, a few cars on the road. It was. Like like you then like you, you discussed in the on the internet, uh, it's just like two two words are joining together. I mean, it's the ordinary word and the and the on the bottom and the something from the outer space coming uh, on the earth. So this is my feeling also when I when I was there and I was I remembered the that movie Independence Day, the Hollywood movie, which was very similar to to this scene. And Marco, one question we're getting from a lot of people through Google Plus that, that you can speak to as an experienced meteorologist really knowing what you're doing in the field. Robert Myers from Los Angeles on Google Plus asked, what constitutes acceptable, acceptable physical risk to obtain a photograph? And I think uh, we as a group can talk about that, but Marco, can you tell us about your planning and, and your experience as you go very you know, seriously into chasing these storms and getting these images? Uh, can you repeat uh, what exactly do you mean? Uh, well, when you're planning to go into situations where the storms do bring some level of risk, yes. how do you plan for that and where do you draw the line to leave a scene when safety uh -huh. becomes too great a risk? Okay, thanks. Uh, well, um, I do aware that uh, storms uh, can produce uh, a lot of damage, can, can actually kill people at the end. We know uh, from the news media that there's a lot of damage uh, caused by severe storms because they are associated with, uh, with tornadoes and large scale. Um, from, from my experiences in the first years, of course, I was maybe a bit more distant, but now I'm, I'm used to it. I, I try to, every time I'm out, uh, out there on the field, I try to, to learn uh, one one piece of the puzzle more, just to know where where is the limit when when you are still safe there and not not in danger. The, actually, if I can I can speak, uh, the main danger which such storms uh, when, when you are let's say uh, you have good experiences, the, the main danger uh, becomes the lightning because a lightning uh, could, uh, could hit outside the, the storm. If you see on the on the photo, there is uh, the, the storm is on the right, but also lightning could hit on the left side uh, over the clear sky. So that's and you there is no way you can predict uh, such such danger, such when when lightning uh, and where we really hit. So, but uh, with experiences, I just uh, learned that I can where I can be in the safest spot uh, before it's come it's becoming too dangerous. So. But when when there is it's too danger too dangerous, I just decide and leave, move to another position to be uh, ahead of the storm for a few minutes and uh, let's say safely enjoy uh, its arrival again. Absolutely, and and well, when you were taking this photograph, Marco, tell us how were you feeling? Did you know this was a photograph that you had not been able to take before, and do you think? you will see a scene quite like this again in the future? Yes, it's, uh, it's quite uh, difficult to say. I mean, uh, in my, let's say, almost 15 years of storm chasing and uh, six uh, years in, in the United States, I mean, I saw a lot of storms. You, you, can, you can imagine uh, being there a few weeks every year, you can see, let's say, maybe 50 to 100 uh, such very impressive storms, but uh, this storm was just something uh, very special because it was uh, it didn't have a, a lot of precipitation. It was just very slowly moving, uh, very very impressive structure. So uh, it's it's hard to it's hard to say uh, how what was the feeling. I mean, it was just I, when when I saw it, I just I just know it that it was it was something special which uh, which was 
which is really rare. I, you can get a lot of structures like this, but uh, this one was, I could say it, it was unique. Absolutely. Well, and one thing that we try to look at when we're editors, we have a question into us from Google Plus from Grant Shepard. Uh, excuse me, from Tyler um, Bach from Idaho. He's asking, what's the first aspect of a photograph you notice? And I think it's a little different for each individual, but I think our finalists really kind of display different aspects that speak to a viewer. In the case of the first prize winner, it's hard not to notice the large cloud in the frame. <laughs> that said, uh, what I really love about the frame is the car. Because it gives scale, it gives a human element, and it really starts to bring the scene together. For me, it's usually the small elements. I think for Mark's photo, for me, he talked a little bit about the leaves that were beginning to show on the tree. I mean, there was an actually, he gives a little final extra to the image that makes me want to know more of that story. Um, David, what do you think? Yeah, you know, to me it just comes down to, like, you see, it, it's summertime, and we go see big Hollywood action movies. This is like a Michael Bay movie. This is like a, a, you look at this, and with the diver too that we're seeing now, the first thing you think is this doesn't connect. This can't be real, and and then you you inspect it further, and it's absolutely real. And and that's like it's it's awesome in in, in both definitions of the word. It it really inspires all. Absolutely, and um, Dan, for you, what stood out first when you saw this photograph? The winning photo? Yes. Or, yeah. Well, actually, I mean, let's speak to each three, all three of them, but the winning well, photo. The winning photo, it was the cloud. It was just how big it was, and, and, and I like the fact that, it's, that the landscape is very spare, that it's just in relation to that. There's just those little group of trees. With the diving photo, I saw the diver right away, and I have to say it took me a minute to realize, wait, why are there leaves growing on a tree underwater? And then you studied and you saw the grass and the pathway and you realized this is a flooded area. And I had heard it was snow melt and I have to say I'm thinking about how cold the water must be. <laughs> and with Aniska's photo, the, the, the smiles, the girls, the gesture with her, well, you know, of course it's the hat. The hat very much like the cloud, you can't really ignore that. But the girl's hand gesture where she's lifting her hand up to her mouth, it's you know, then you feel human emotion in the photograph. And actually, uh, speaking, we've spoken a bit about the photographs, but one thing I'd like to do is have the finalists maybe ask a question of each other. Do, do any of you have a question for each other about the photographs um, and your experiences? Uh, actually, when I was uh, watching the first um, uh, the first award. Um, I know that it, it might um, sounds funny, but I was thinking if Marco managed to to write his last will before uh, this experience, <laughs> because it looks so crazy, dangerous uh, that you know I I would really hesitate to pack myself into a situation which uh, my life would be in such a risk. Uh, this is what I was thinking about, about the risk. Uh, we were talking about it a little bit, but uh, about the risk of, uh, you know, risk uh, to, to, to not only to damage your car, but just to lose your life. So uh, do, you, do you calculate, is it worth? Uh, absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Yes, it is worth, okay. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, because... Um, Storage ASIC is a uh, dangerous, uh, dangerous uh, work to do. I mean, you do need a lot of experience to know uh, where to be and when is the, where is the last, uh, where is the limit uh, when you turn away and, uh, and let's say escape from the storm. So, um, mm. going this uh, inexperience it would uh, would definitely put you in in big danger. So. As, as this, we know is, this is very important to know your limits. Uh, of course, yes. what you are doing, uh, it can be hardly comparing with what I am doing within the Orthodox community. But to tell you the truth, uh, one is uh, one one uh, thing is in common. Uh, if I wouldn't know my limits, my life would be also in danger. So. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Well, with that, everyone, I think we're going to have to wrap up the Google Hangout today. But we appreciate everyone's participation, both in the Google Hangouts sphere, and also thank you to our finalists. Uh, 
congratulations on your win. Thank it's you. been a pleasure hearing yeah. about your photography and your work, and we hope to keep following you and see where it takes you. Mm. And if you would like to continue the conversation, please reach out to National Geographic on Facebook, Twitter, and we'll try to answer more of your questions on the hashtag Let's Explore. And sincere thanks to all 2014 Traveler, for, Traveler Photo Contest participants. It was a pleasure seeing your photographs, mm -hmm. and we can't wait to see more of the world and explore with you again. Thanks, everyone, and we'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Sarah. Bye-bye. Thank Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.